Hello everyone and welcome to Student Hub Live with me, Rob Moore, coming to you from the Study Shack in Leicestershire. It's a lovely sunny day, so hopefully we're going to have a nice, warm, exciting show for you. Today we're going to be talking to my colleagues from the Faculty in Business and Law. That's my home faculty, so I'm always pleased when I, I talk to my colleagues. Um, in the chat, we've got Sam and Kevin, and they're going to be answering your specific questions. They'll be giving you some hints and some tips. So you'll recognize uh, when they post a message because they will have SHL in front of their names. And of course, we've got Heidi with us, and Heidi's going to be passing your messages on to me and telling us the things that you're already talking about. So Heidi, who have we got in the chat box and what are they saying at the moment? Morning, Rob, and hello to everybody in the chat. So we've got Loz in Chichester. So Loz is a first year law student um, joining today to see how law modules are created. Loz is hoping to become a student rep. And she feels that knowing how the modules are created will help in the role. Um, Angela has just completed W111 and is starting W112 in October. We've got Tesh in Corby, who's also studying law. We've got Chris from Merseyside, currently studying uh, business B100. Uh, Mel is joining us from Hampshire. And Loz has really kindly put some details in the chat. So anyone that's studying W111 that started um, January, February, criminal law and the courts um, there's a facebook page a group student facebook page that they've got available um, so if you want to search for that if you're studying w111 um, then you can join the facebook group um, and loz has advised it'll be updated to w112 in october i know when i was studying those facebook groups were an absolute godsend so highly recommended so yeah quite a few people saying hello already in the chat rob brilliant and yeah becoming a student rep is a great idea i'm actually a, a, a al rep so uh, I go to the similar meetings that you'll go to as a student rep, and this will definitely help with those uh, those meetings and that understanding. So a couple of ways to get in touch with us today. You can email us, and the email's on the web page, or you can join in on the chat or the widgets. Now, the widget we've got at the moment, the little thing on the right-hand side of the screen, is a multiple-choice question asking what degree you're doing. So let us know which of the degrees you're actually studying at the moment. And there's a little ticker going across the bottom of the screen. That's a question we want you to consider and answer in the chat. So what sort of things do you consider when you're selecting your next module? So we'd like to know what you're thinking about. Well, my guests today from the law school are Fred and Sarah. Uh, welcome both. Uh, Fred, um, the, joins me in the study sessions on Student Hub Live. So those who've been to some of our study sessions will recognize uh, me and Fred as a partnership from there. So great to have you with us. Uh, we're going to start off with Sarah. So Sarah, when you put a degree together, how do you choose the module topics that go into the degree to make sure it's, um, it's fully rounded? What do you think about? Thanks, Rob. Morning. Um that's a really interesting question at the moment, actually, because as you probably know, and as many of our students know, we've been through the process recently of developing our new LLB, which has been very exciting. But we have had to really think about what modules are we going to include on that degree um, and, and how is that going to be structured? And as, as many people will know, there has been quite a lot of restructuring, quite a lot of changes. So what did we consider? Well, law is um, it's a very professionally driven qualifications. So we have to consider professional requirements. Um, and there have been changes there recently as well. So students who are looking to become solicitors, for instance, will be aware that there have been recent changes um, and that they're now not required, unless they're in Northern Ireland, of course, they're not required to do the qualifying law degree and they'll go on and do the SQE modules. Um, however, students who are in Northern Ireland and want to be a solicitor will need their qualifying law degree subjects and and they will need also to do evidence as well. Uh, and students who are budding barristers, again, are going to need to do a, a certain set of subjects in order to enter into that profession. So we have to really consider that when we're putting our degree together. Um, and additionally, we have a lot of uh, 
joint degree students. So we have students who are studying law and languages. We have students who are studying law and criminology. And we want to make sure that the program fits together nicely for those students as well, and that they're studying things that are useful to them, and that they're studying in a way which um, has some great continuity in the pathway that they're following. So all of those kind of practical considerations, first of all. Um, yeah. And then we really have taken into account the uh, the student feedback we've had. So we know from students that they wanted to see more choices in their degree pathway. They wanted to have um, more options. And we've tried to introduce that. We have introduced it at level two, particularly, um, where students, instead of studying two 60 credit modules, will now study four 30 credit modules and will have those options about the sorts of topics they want to study. They've got much more variety. Um, so they can study, for instance, family law, um, employment and business law. They can study evidence law, even if they're not uh, doing the Northern Ireland qualifying law degree, evidence law is there as an option for them. And that's a really popular option. It's a great module. Um, and we've also got international and space law, um, which again is, is a really great option for students wanting to study uh, international law, but also bringing in something that's a bit different, that's progressive, um, that is something that we're going to be thinking about in the future. Um, what else? Just to be clear, uh, <laughs> so different professions might require different modules to be chosen in the degree, is that right? Yeah, um, that's exactly right, yeah. And how do students know they're doing the right thing? Where will they find that information? Mm, they should talk to student services. So um, SST are really, really knowledgeable about this. And what we have done um, as a team is we have provided regular updates to SST throughout the development. Um, and we engage with them really regularly. And they come to us with questions and they ask us questions. But they have really great and up to date information about the different pathways so they can give great advice. And, and the feedback I've had from students is when they when they talk to SST, they know, they know what students need to do um, in order to progress on their pathway. And if they don't, they'll contact me or Fred or someone else on the team um, and we can talk yeah. to them about it. Because I think that's, that's the key thing. We want students to be confident that the, the degree they get is going to take them to the, the point they want to get to in their career. Because uh, am I right in thinking most people studying um, law are looking for law as a profession? They might be, Rob. Um, so we have a lot of people who go into the legal profession, but the, the law degree is really useful in a number of professions. So many of our students might be studying law just for academic purposes, um, and, and they may just really enjoy the subject, or they may want to go into academia later. Um, and, and we have a really rigorous program uh, academically as well. They might want to go into another profession, for example, the police or public services or social services. Uh, they might want to go into the civil service, they might want to work in local government, they might want to work in a whole range of jobs um, and professions where law is really great grounding, um, really useful and very highly valued by employers. So uh, you're right in saying it is very professional in nature and uh, there are a lot of skills, employability skills built in to help students move into the legal professions, but those skills are really transferable elsewhere. So you really have to, as a, as a module team, you really have to bring into, uh, into mind all of these different reasons why somebody might want to study and make sure that you're keeping that all accessible as well as fitting it into the time and <laughs> making it interesting. Because, of course, we want an interesting qualification to study. Uh, so should we have a quick look at the, um, uh, the widgets, see what people are studying at the moment? So Heidi, do you want to talk us through what uh, what people are focusing on and what they're saying at the moment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm not sure if people can see the widget okay. If you haven't um, put your details in there yet and, and let us know what you're studying, please do. The widget will automatically update itself. So it looks like the law undergraduate is taking the lead at the moment. And that's what most people in the chat are studying, mm -hmm. which makes absolute sense. So um, yeah, we've got um, we've got quite a number of um, law undergraduates um, in the chat, and then um, uh, other. Yeah, we've got other. So I'm not quite sure what what other mm -hmm. uh, encapsulates there, but that's uh, that's the second most popular at thirty percent. So please do let us know what it is that you're studying. Um, yeah, so add the details into the widget. Oh, and it's updating as I speak. There we are. More people, law undergrads. So that's great to see. 
<laughs> Excellent. I think the the other is, is everybody who isn't doing um, business or law at the moment, I think. So, uh, <laughs> so you are very welcome if you're not in business law, but you should be in business and law because that's where the exciting uh, material sits. Uh, so, Sarah, just a, a quick question about developing the, um, the content. Uh, we had uh, a comment about being a student rep earlier. How do you as a module team um, take advantage of having student reps and how do you bring them into those broader discussions? Mm, student reps are really important to us. So um, we have student reps who sit on our board of studies and board of studies, in case students don't know, is um, a group whereby um, it's chaired by the teaching director. Uh, and we also have other academics, so module team chairs, we have head of student experience, but we have student reps and we also have reps from um, SST, from uh, careers and employability to, to bring in different voices. And what the board of studies will do is, is really shape um, the way in which the curriculum is developing by setting targets and having that student voice there is really, really important to us um, because students can bring in uh, issues that they're having, questions that they've got, um, feedback that they've got. But in developing the module, uh, the modules and the qualification, we didn't just rely on the Board of Studies, of course. You've probably seen um, that we have regular student consultations, so online consultations whereby um, we set up a forum uh, to look at a particular topic and during um, the course development, that was very much based on the stuff we needed to know to make sure that we were um, serving the student needs. So we were asking students about things like assessment. Mm -hmm. We were asking about things like induction, um, things like tutor support, so that we could make sure we were building that in. We also had a group of students who, who were fantastic, who came to talk to us um, as a group of uh, central academics um, and do a presentation for us. So they came and uh, I think we had six students, they came and they spoke to us uh, about different topics and they gave us all that feedback and they were very forthright, they were very frank and it was fantastic to hear that direct um, feedback from the students. And Rob, as you know, you're an AL, I'm an AL, uh, feedback from ALs is really important as well because ALs have that kind of really close relationship with the students. Students often experience the open university or generally experience it through their tutor um, and so they will tell their tutors things and by engaging tutors in those discussions, we hear a lot of what students are saying on the ground and, and we can incorporate that mm. into the degree. Absolutely. And yeah, it's so important to give honest feedback because we build mm. so much on it. So I'm going to move on to the next widget now. This is a word cloud. Uh, what is your favourite law subject? And if you're not a law student, make one up. We like to see some invented law subjects as well. So what would make a really good law subject if you were to make one up? Um, and um, yeah, what makes a good law module? What would be a nice structure? So we're going to bring Fred in at this point, And Fred's going to tell us about how we structure a particular module. So Sarah talked about how we bring modules and topics together to make a degree. So Fred, what goes into actually making a module? And as a module team member, what what do you, how do you choose what to put in? And what <laughs> the thing I know is really difficult, what to leave out? Thanks, Rob. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I think in some ways, um, designing modules and deciding on the content of modules is the most enjoyable part of our central academic role. Um, as, as Sarah mentioned, many of us, um, including myself, uh, are ALs as well. Um, and obviously we really enjoy the teaching, but with our, our sort of uh, academic hats on, um, deciding what goes in a module is a real chance for us to think about what's interesting, what's important, and um, what will work well um, for students to study. Um, normally that's a process that tends to start with the module team chair, the person in charge of the module, and um, the other authors. Um, we, we also look at a lot of the same sources that Sarah's mentioned. Um, we look particularly, of course, at the feedback on uh, the previous module. Normally in law, we don't tend to be creating modules from nowhere. Um, we do occasionally add new options, but, but normally there is a module that's covered at least some of this ground before. So for example, on the new degree, um, when when I was working on 
um, 112, uh, the tort law module, and on 212, the contract law module, we were very much looking at the old W202 and looking at what students liked and what students didn't like. Um, because as, as we, we know in law, there are certain parts of the syllabus that are seen as being very um, set in stone. Um, but what we try and do at the OU, uh, and one of the things we've done with the new degree, um, where we've, we've switched from looking at two substantive areas of law to one in most modules, um, we try and include that, that extra area where people don't just learn what they have to know, um, but also get a chance to learn perhaps um, what we consider might be more interesting or might be something that they might want to explore further academically or professionally. Okay, so how do you, um, I, I'm thinking about if I was studying a module, what I would like to know is how do we make sure that we've got enough time to study it? Because uh, I, I can imagine so many topics fitting in in how do you balance that breadth and depth aspect in the module? What, what's at the front, forefront of your mind when you're, when you're choosing them? Is there a, a driving force? Is there a, a checklist that you go through? Um, it depends to some extent, module to module. Um, but certainly in the law school, um, what I should say straight away is that uh, we do have very strict uh, rules um, in terms of the workload. So each unit is, is intended to take roughly the same amount of time, which is the amount of time that we expect students to be able to study each week. Of course, as, yeah. as all of you will know um, who are uh, watching this, not every week necessarily you have the same amount of time to, to study. But the idea is that you don't sort of suddenly get to week 12 or unit 7 and it's 10 times more than you were expecting. So what we tend to do is try and think, first of all, well, how do we balance that out. So, you know, if we have a module with 12, uh, 12 units, what, how can we divide up what we want to cover into 12? Um, and I think what a lot of module chairs do um, is we sort of try and establish what has to go in. And then um, we have the, the more enjoyable task of deciding what else we can, we can do. Um, and I think one thing we've tried to do really on the new degree is give modules a bit more of a theme um, that runs right through rather than it being a set of individual units. So, yeah. um, for example, for those of you um, who are um, at or, or about to go on to level two, um, we've got the two core modules at level two, uh, public law and contract law, both with really strong themes. Public law is all about the four nations and the fact that the United Kingdom is, is made up of these different um, in many ways, very individual and different uh, nations and how our uh, wider UK constitution brings them together or, or perhaps pushes them apart. Uh, and in contract law, we've got a real focus on contract and modern technology, uh, which again runs right through the module. So the idea is that what we hope to do is give you something that, that week by week you're looking at different things, but that also comes together as a whole. And, and that's often a a way of deciding what we can and can't include does it does it match up to our, our wider theme absolutely you've got that uh, that fictitious average student who will take an average amount of time to do a study and of course we, we know that every student is different some will take longer some will take shorter but it's good to know we've got um, a measuring mind for how long a module should take and i like the fact that we're, uh, you, you mentioned the themes and the module should flow naturally and build up. So some real thought going into how the individual modules are put together. So Heidi, how's the chat getting on and how's the widget looking? busy in the chat. Yeah, so on the widget, if you haven't let us know um, what your favourite um, law is that you're, you've been studying or your main area of interest, then please do let us know in the widget. At the moment, Rob, we're seeing criminology and family law coming out top, um, which I can relate to. I did my master's in criminology and I have um, a particular interest in criminology. Um, love it. Um, 
And there's been some really interesting conversations going on that my um, colleague Samantha has sparked around B law. Um, so Samantha mentioned that that um, she owns a book on B law, um, and it's all around beekeepers and who's responsible for the damage. And it sparked some really um, great conversations. So Dottie said bees and law sounds really interesting. How do you even track the bees bees owner down to sue them for any damage that they might cause? <laughs> um, dogs are insured, but never thought of bees. So I thought that's a fascinating thing about law, isn't it? Sometimes we completely overlook these areas, and then you think, oh my god gosh, there is legislation in place there. And it's really interesting to do some more digging. Um, we also touched um, briefly earlier, we were asking people around how they decide what modules they're going to take. Um, so we've had some responses to that as well. So Loz is thinking about what career path uh, she wants to do and what modules that are needed for that job. Um, Andy's mm -hmm. heavily influenced by the module route plan, although I'm always looking yeah. for alternative options because the OU is really flexible, which is great. And then Tesh, um, I take past experience into consideration when deciding on um, the chosen course. So yeah, lots going on in the chat. Please do um, add to it and uh, be sure to um, add to the widget as well. Absolutely. And I think that uh, that comment about the flexibility is really important because you don't have to start at the beginning of your six years and map your your pattern out and stick to it. If you want to be flexible and change, that's great. And I really should be wearing my glasses when I do this because I was trying to figure out what Marmite law was. And then with a bit of a squint, it's maritime law. So, <laughs> yeah, the, um, there we go. So, the next question we're going to ask you is what's your favorite type of assessment uh and we're not accepting the answer none so uh pop in your chat uh which are the favorite types of questions you like to answer in your assignment and i'm going to bring sarah back in for this and sarah uh, how do we consider assessment when we're building up the degree and we're building up modules um, what what is it that um, you need to consider when designing the assignments? Hmm. Um, so, in law, we don't have any exams, which some most students are always pleased to hear. Some students are disappointed about. I that, heard the, the cheer from here. Then <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, absolutely. The majority of students delight in that, but uh, uh, <laughs> we don't have exams. But. Uh, in not having exams, it really allows us to be flexible in the terms of assessments um, we offer and we ask students to complete. And what we want to do in setting assessments is to really make sure that we're addressing the learning outcomes, so the stuff that we really need students to know and to be able to exhibit um, by the end of um, their module. So it might be, for instance, that we're choosing assessments which are quite traditional. So things like essays so that students can exhibit um, their knowledge and understanding, their ability to critically analyze, um, their writing skills, um, their skills of interpretation, all of those things. Or we might do problem questions which are a little more dynamic and, and, and real life and they allow students to apply the law to a situation. Um, but we can broaden out from that as well, looking forward uh, to when students who want to be solicitors are taking their solicitors qualifying exam, they'll be taking multiple choice questions for that. And so in the new degree, we've tried to build in multiple choice questions in a way which will be useful to students going forward. So not just multiple choice questions to um, to test knowledge. So, you know, something like, oh, which of these statutes, um, you know, represents this, this area of law. Um, but really thinking around how we can introduce scenarios, uh, how we can introduce application of law, how we can get students to pick out um, relevant facts, relevant information and apply the law to that through multiple choice questions. Um, we might ask students to reflect. So that's a really valuable assessment tool in terms of academia, helping students to develop academically, looking back and saying, you know, how did I do that? Why did I do that? Um, and what next? What going forwards? But also uh, a really important employability skill. Uh, you know, Rob, you and I have to reflect yeah. on our practice constantly. Right. We have to think about what worked. Um, why did it work? What did students enjoy? And we do it on the new degree. You know, what, what what's the the yep. feedback we've had. Um, how are we going to take that forwards? Um, so all different types of assessment. The other thing we've really tried to build into the new degree is um, authentic assessment. So we've talked already, I guess, about how law is a very professional and practical subject um, going forwards into 
the, the legal profession and other professions. Um, and so we've tried to build in assessments which are really authentic um, and things like case studies that run through the whole unit and we'll have different information, uh, different um, documents, legal documents students need to refer to and they'll, they'll undertake things um, assessment tasks in the way they might in practice. So it might be drafting an attendance note or an email. Um, it might be giving advice to a client. All these sorts of different things that students will, will be doing one day in practice or in their role. Um, we've tried to build into the assessment to meet the learning outcomes, but also prepare students for after the degree. I've got to say, I really like the modules where we have a case study that runs through, where you can really get into the nitty gritty. It's not just a, a single page article that you're looking at, but you, you go to do some real research into, mm. uh, into the problem or the company. In my case, it's normally companies and um, yeah, really have some good discussions and some great opportunities on the tutor group forums as well to collaborate. And um, making the resources is fun as well, Rob. So last oh, week I oh, was yes. <laughs> uh, on campus with a, a team videoing um, some different video clips to show different parts of the scenario developing. And it really builds life into the modules and um, makes students feel kind of immersed in, in the materials that they're studying. Okay, absolutely. Uh, we, earlier, we asked the students, um, the people at home, what their study snacks are. And... Um, I think it's a good opportunity, Heidi, to tell us what people are munching on while they're studying. And also, have they got any quick questions for Fred or Sarah at the moment? Um, we haven't had, had, had any responses to the study snacks yet. So um, I can't see any updates on my widget. Oh. So please do let us know um, what your top three study snacks are and pop your, um, pop your details. If you can choose the top three, uh, many to choose from. But we do oh, I've got um, a widget have a showing me crisps as the top. Oh, oh that, right. My different... widget's not working. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> there we go. Crisps, hot oh, wow. nubs, and chocolate. So obviously Isabella has been in voting because um, chocolate's there. Mind you, if Isabella was there, that would be a lot bigger than everything else. <laughs> so, <laughs> did, did we have any questions for Fred or Sarah? Just uh, Yeah, did... uh, we do. I've got a question for um, Sarah. So this is from Loz. Are there any plans to bring in aviation law, Sarah? Um, at the moment, no, because we have finished developing um, the modules and, and choosing the modules that we're going to have on the new degree. That's not to say it will never happen, um, but at the moment there isn't a plan to do that. Um, if you had a particular interest, of course, all of the library resources are available to you. And what I would say is contact the librarians and they can help you find information about anything you want if you want to do some extra reading around a particular area. Um, when I talk to the librarians, they always say to me, oh, we love it when students contact us and ask us for help in finding uh, different research um, resources. So, uh, you know, if it's something you want to read about and it's not on the degree, there are still resources available to you. And do students get the opportunity to do independent research or is it all directed? So can they go and find an area they want to research or is that, say, for the master's programme? Is that for me or for Fred, Rob? Oh, well, Fred, because we haven't heard from Fred for a while. Sorry, Fred. <laughs> Uh, um, we try and build research skills right through the degree. So um, those of you who are starting off, you'll, you'll know that at level one, um, we very much try and we, we, we sort of start telling you this is where to go. Uh, and This is what to look at. Um, at level two, um, we introduce the idea of independent research. I know uh, 211 uh, public law has a lot of uh, really important information these days on um, assessing how reliable sources are and how much you can uh, how much you can trust the sources you find online um, and then I think really it's 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 at level three um, so so the sort of um, final set of modules that you'll study where there is a real opportunity to um, to widen out and I think in in a lot of those modules um, probably more the ones that are not SQE focused the SQE modules obviously have that more professional, uh, focus mm -hmm. and and a lot of sort of what you're doing beyond the subject is learning about um, how uh, the law works in practice and and the rules around litigation. Um, the other modules, the modules with the more academic focus, 
really do start encouraging students to to go independently um, and 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 research areas of interest. Um, and of course, uh, you know uh, that that's something. If you really enjoy that, definitely. That then, if you want to go on to postgraduate study, um, I'm I'm doing a PhD in my part time uh, with the Open University at the minute, and obviously that really does let let you decide what to. Uh, what you want to look at, um, which is why I've chosen uh, VAR in football as the topic of my PhD. Wow, that should be interesting, if not slightly controversial. Uh, so thank you, Sarah and Fred. That's a really fascinating look into how we start to build degrees and how we bring the modules together. So thank you for your time today. Uh, I've now been joined by Isadora and Charles from the Business School, and they're going to talk us through some of the research that they've been doing and how that's translated into the modules. And also we're going to talk about how business modules are created and put together. So it might be a slight difference to the way that we consider business degrees, business modules to the discussion we've just had on law. And there's a word cloud to join in. Uh, what is your favorite business subject? And again, as before, if you want to make up your own fake business subject, I'm always glad to see some fictitious business subjects, but see what you want to put in the word cloud. So first of all, Charles, tell us about how you would build a business module and what are the things you consider? So what is it that, uh, as a module chair, what do you want to bring in and why? Yeah, thank you so much indeed, uh, Rob, uh, for that and for being here. So uh, one of the most important things that I would consider is uh, what we've set as the learning outcomes. Um, so usually you, at the very beginning, when you're conceptualizing a module, you, you have to careful as a team think through what you want to bring across. And the best thing we do is to uh, set up uh, a set of learn learning outcomes, which goes through a number of iterations. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a, a back and forth before we convince ourselves that is the set we want to have. And usually this is also at various levels. You have the qualification level, so the overall level, for example, if it's uh, you know an undergraduate program or the master's program, you have uh, to know what the final goal is. Is it, uh, you know, a BA degree in something? Is it a, mm -hmm. an MBA? So you have that overall set of of outcomes which you have to uh, agree, and then you start cascading them down into uh, the modules, into the various things that you're doing. Uh, so as an example, I teach, and uh, Rob, you also teach on B302. Uh, we have mm -hmm. module learning outcomes there, which relate with the higher degree or the qualification that students are then doing. Uh, and so there's a process of uh, linking these these different units. You then within the module we have the various uh, weeks. Uh, you have uh, weekly learning outcomes. Uh, within those, then we have activities. We have tutorials. Uh, we have TGF discussions, we have collaborative activities. So in all those aspects, you have to see that the learning outcomes are being reflected. Uh, and so one of the, that's one of the most important things that we do at the OU to make sure that these learning outcomes are, are current, they reflect what is, you know, what the students are looking for uh, on the course. They are pedagogically sound. We, we do, uh, we shall come back to that when we think of research, how we put research into, into this, that they, are, that they are also interesting. You know, you, you, want, you don't want to spend your time on something that is just, you know, uh, you, know you, you just, you, you just doesn't, doesn't capture your interest. Uh, so are they interesting? Are they current? Uh, are they inspirational? Are they clear? Uh, and sometimes then we, we think of, of smart outcomes. Can you measure them? Uh, mm -hmm. Can the students put a, their hands on them? Uh, and when they finish, what will they remember? Will, they, will it just have been a dry thing to remember an academic exercise that has no uh, implication at all for practice? So and we've so got the widget the... ready, Charles. So this is what the students think would make a good module. So if we have a quick look at it on the screen, um, yeah. They they think that we should be covering sustainability, innovation, 
international business. Uh, are these sorts of things that you've covered? Are these, do these crop up in all of the undergraduate modules? <clears throat> yeah, so these are then, of course, um, you'd have to think of the specific ones, like those ones which they have named, definitely. That, then mm -hmm. that, that goes to their module level, where, for example, if it is uh, an international module, it's covering international aspects. Uh, for example, we have a module on the MBA program. It's called Contemporary Issues in Organizations. Well, we have mm -hmm. a unit there which is uh, more about multinationals and how they internationalize, how they go into different uh, different markets. So you have to think of those things they have mentioned there that the students have uh, actually raised. So <clears throat> sustainability, governance. So, so all this has to be considered, you know, at, at a more granular level of the module to make sure you're getting it right. That you know, at the end uh, when they finish, they have a very good understanding of all of this. So when we when you introduced um, the, the, the topic, you mentioned that we both work on B302. That's the, the level three strategy course. Right. And there's a big element of uh, collaborative working in there. So why do we bring collaborative working into a module? Why? Why is it important? Because I know some students say, well, I'm, I've, I've, I don't want to work with other people. I want to work on my own. So why is there <laughs> such an emphasis on collaborative working? Yes. Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, we think in the in the real world of business, you you have to to work with others, others both within the organization, uh, but also outside. You know, we talk of, of stakeholders, so internal stakeholders, but also external stakeholders. Uh, you you have to interact with your suppliers. You interact with your even your competitors. You interact with. Mm -hmm with the regulators, you interact with, you know, uh, with, with the general public, with your customers, with so all types of stakeholders you interact with. So there's always a form of collaboration taking place. You, you develop new projects with, with, with partners. Uh, and this usually calls for interacting with them. It can be face to face, but it can also be virtual, you know, you know, using, a, you know, virtual communication tools. Uh, and so, Collaboration is always important. We there are not many things where we 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 do things alone. Even on the on these on these courses that we do at the OU, uh, many of the assignments uh, uh, you know call for some kind of working together uh, with other students. Uh, for example, in this resort which you just mentioned, Rob, uh, there's that activity uh, which involves a case study of a Scottish uh, company. It's called Uni. Mm -hmm. So here we expect students to come together and analyze, analyze that case, go through the process of, of creating a strategy and assessing how good that strategy is. Uh, and so that involves that, giving I, feedback, yes, and, and, and you know, yeah. hearing from others. And that collaborative part, some students find that the most rewarding part of the module and that opportunity to have that realistic interaction with people they might not have met. Uh, right. We're going to move on and talk to Izzy now. Um, so Izzy, we're looking at uh, your research into gamification and how we can bring uh, games into modules. And there's a new widget what games would you like to see in a module? So let's see if we can give, uh, is there some interesting uh, ideas for future modules? But, but tell us about your research, because I know I've been involved with your research as well. Um, <laughs> tell us about your research into gamification and why it's important when we're considering new modules. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. And let me tell you that we really count on everyone's support when we do this kind of research that fits back into the module, both when it comes to the academic team, to the AELs and the students, of course. Um, so I have been involved in different kind of mod of uh, research that does fit back into the modules. And uh, one of the most recent one is the one that you mentioned, the gamification. Uh, so we're looking with another colleague from the OU and uh, the use and the impact of simulation games in FBL modules, particularly in undergraduate modules. And uh, the main reason for doing so is that we, we know that several research has proved that when it comes to teaching complex subjects like uh, theories, models, perspectives, and most importantly, practical skills, 
it's easier for the students to grasp this kind of context and practical skills uh, through games. So by playing a game, uh, they are able to learn in depth and more successfully all these uh, kind of concepts that in theory, uh, they, they, they are difficult to grasp. And then it comes the practice through the simulation game when we can actually apply this knowledge and make sure that you do understand how it is applied in a somehow real context environment. Uh, so imagine that with the simulation games, we do offer to the students the opportunity to try in a safe environment where, for example, they won't cause any, any interruption in supply chains. They won't cause any issues in the product development or uh, in the employees of the organization. So there is a safe environment that they can practice uh, these skills mm -hmm. and get, the, get, get um, more advanced and learn how to do so in contrast to more traditional kind of methods. Uh, so for, the, for example, at the OU, we do have the VLE, we do have the videos, we have um, different kind of interactives. And all of these, they are important tools in order to learn the concepts that we are trying to teach the students, but more complex concepts and practical skills, they are better learned and in depth through these uh, simulation games. And uh, what we have tried to do is that uh, we did uh, work with this uh, particular module, B205, and B205 is an undergraduate level module in entrepreneurship. So in B205, we have the Neo game. And Neo game is, um, is a negotiation game uh, that maybe you can tell more about it, uh, Rob, than mm -hmm. myself. But uh, I will just give a brief summary of it. It's like a negotiation uh, game. And this is where the previous discussion on collaboration comes on board as well, because we do see the collaborative element as very important for the students to be equipped and to learn how to work with others. So we do have this negotiation that takes place with uh, another student from the module. And the students have different kind of scenarios and they negotiate the outcome of the, of the scenario. Uh, so they have the possibility say, to play the game a couple of times until they polish their negotiation skills in different kind of contexts and with different kind of scenarios. And what we try to do as a team in our research was to explore whether the, the use of NEO is effective, how NEO is incorporated in B205, and whether it should be incorporated and under what conditions in the new uh, version of the module, which is going to come, mm -hmm. and that's uh, the B209. And uh, allow me here to take the opportunity, Rob, to mention something which I think is very important, that at the OU, we make sure that all the modules are current and they stay current uh, throughout their life. So we have B205, which is a successful module. It runs smoothly and uh, the student seems to be very happy with this module. And despite of that, uh, there is a particular uh, element, uh, which is after a, a particular period of time, we do renew the modules, even if they are very successful, even if we don't have any issues, we don't have any complaints about them. Because at the heart of the OU is to keep the modules uh, current, to keep uh, the debates current and to incorporate all the changes from a theoretical, practical, case point perspective and so on. So we have B205 that now we're going to, uh, to update in B209. And with our research and by talking and collecting data, both uh, from the students, uh, from the academic member of the team, which is uh, on the production, on the presentation side, along with the tutors, we're coming back with some recommendations in terms of how the simulation game NEO should be included, because the overall conclusion is that NEO is very successful and overall simulation games, they do work very well and they do enhance the overall student experience and learning in the module material. So we're coming back with recommendations in terms of where NEO must sit in the new module, uh, for how long, where it should be placed, and so on. So, and, and that's not only me, that's all of the colleagues. We do try to do research that it's relevant to the module because at, at what we really believe at the OU is that the module uh, must be relevant and they must offer the best student experience and to enhance student learning in any way possible. Absolutely. And, and you're right. NEO is a great activity where students anonymously engage. And because it's anonymous, you can take on different personas, try different um, approaches in a safe environment. So Heidi, we've got some suggestions, I think, for different games that could be included. So what sort of things would, uh, would the people at home like to include in a module? Yeah, we certainly do, Rob. So um, Sam, who's my colleague, uh, would like to see Monopoly in Land Law. Um, Elizabeth <laughs> would like uh, Snakes and Ladders, How Markets Grow and Shrink. And then Susie has suggested Hangman. I like that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And to the, the sort of games that uh, we've just been discussing, a lot of them are actually available on Open Learn. 
So another module I work on, which is supply chain management, has the supply chain game. And that's available for anybody to play. A, a simplified version of it is available for anybody to play on Open Learn. But we use it as a significant element within uh, that particular module. Uh, I'm going to move on to, to Charles again. So, Charles, I know you've been doing some research recently, and you've been that your research is um, is being used as a significant case study in a module. Would you like to tell us a little about that? Yeah, thank you so much indeed, um, Rob. So yeah, that, that's true. And and picking up on that point that Isidora was mentioning, that we we try to use research as the foundation uh, for all our modules. So I've been doing some research in the energy sector. Uh, I did my my uh, PhD uh, on. Uh, reforms in the energy industry on the African continent. So I looked at, you know, the privatization of various uh, dam projects. You remember, traditionally, governments have owned these uh, power, uh, dam power projects and, and energy, both generation, transmission, and, and distribution. So uh, with perform, uh, market reforms that have been taking place, governments have been trying to uh, unbundle. We, we, we use the term called unbundling, you know, making it more private and, and bringing in economics, and, you know, in these things. So I've been studying a lot around, you know, that energy sector in various parts of the world. Uh, and also uh, recently I've been doing a lot in about uh, renewables, so solar, wind, uh, biomass, mm -hmm. how we can use the, this a bit more to, you know, to improve access to energy in various parts of the world. Uh, and so um, in B302, if we go back to that example, we have a case from Uganda, one of the dam projects. Uh, it's called Bujagali. Uh, we use that as uh, to understand especially something called non-market strategy. So there are many things when you are developing such a project that are not only uh, related to market considerations, but also non-market consideration, which means the interaction with with uh, political actors, with social actors, with environmental actors, and this particular project uh, is on at the source of the River Nile, and it was very very controversial uh, because it would have it, it meant uh, actually flooding a whole area and flooding uh, very sensitive cultural sites, uh, for example, which have been had been there for for centuries. People you know around that part of the world had been. Uh, in some cases, using it as their religion and, you know, cultural beliefs and so on. So it was a very, very controversial thing to do. Uh, and the mm -hmm. companies, the multinationals involved had to do a lot of interaction with uh, the local people, with governments and various actors. So we use this case mm -hmm. to try to explain how companies can develop their CSR strategy. Uh, right. and how they can do that effectively and deal with all kinds of, of challenges. And that we also say that uh, this is an important aspect to to add to market strategy that we normally use mm -hmm. traditionally in, in teaching strategy. Uh, and so yeah, we have that. It's so Gary important case. that uh, that we're taking this the current research, this up to the minute research, and we're embedding it within our modules. So your current modules and uh, as we said earlier, it's so important to be up to date and right where we need to be in current. So thank That's you for that, Charles. Uh, I've no just worries. got one very quick um, uh, quick question for Isadora. Uh, and if you can do this in a couple of minutes, that would be great. Uh, how, do, how do we make sure that our modules are accessible? So how do we make sure that all students can um, take part and as a module team what's going through your mind as you're designing the module in terms of accessibility uh, okay so that, that's a very important question to be answering in, uh, in in a couple of minutes i will try my best rob though uh, you know um accessibility equality and diversity and inclusion is 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 again at the heart of the of the ou and it all starts from the production process as you said but even even beyond that we, we have to make sure that we have the right teams put in place in order to produce mm -hmm. the module that it does it, it is it is open uh, to all students so what we what we usually do and i will give you an example from b329 which is an undergraduate module um, a leadership one 
when when we selected the production team, we made sure that we had a team that it was coming from different backgrounds, not only uh, disciplinary backgrounds, uh, because we do have experts in this team uh, that are they are experts in leadership in SMEs, leadership in entrepreneurship, leadership in organizations, and so on. But it was also a multicultural team. Uh, so this is a team of uh, from the UK, from uh, people uh, from Italy, and from Greece as well. So we all brought our expertise and our cultural background when we produce B329 to make sure that this uh, multi-diversity team is actually, uh, the, 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 the nature of the team is reflected on the module material. We make sure that our cases, the videos that we use, the exams that we have into the module, they do actually address uh, students from different backgrounds, both male and female. Uh, we have to make the module accessible to students with disabilities. And we do make sure that we, not only when producing the module with the material that we produce, but also during the presentation, the modules, they do work well for all the students. Uh, so we do have the equality, diversity, inclusion, accessibility champions in our module. I am, for example, the, the champion for B329, and my role is to make sure that the material uh, responds to the needs of the students uh, currently and uh, during production, but now during presentation as well. We do have the inclusion uh, curriculum tool, which is again another tool that we use for new and uh, older versions of the modules to make sure that all the material reflects the students' needs. So it does come to the team that brings this together, uh, the module, the material, and also the material itself. So as I said, the case studies, the videos, the, 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 all the interactive activities, the examples that we use, make sure that they are multidisciplinary uh, and also multicultural as well for, for the students. Absolutely. And it's so good to know that we've got specific teams looking at these uh, equality and accessibility issues. So it's not an add on that goes on once we've written the module. It's considered right at the start. How are we going to make this accessible? Are there any specific needs that we need to address? Are there things that we need to bring in? So you did fantastically well to get through all that. Uh, um, so thank you very much, Isadora. Uh, Heidi, thank you. what what are we hearing in the chat? Uh, so the conversations um, are continuing in the chat around um, games a little bit more. Um, so there's been some discussions around how students can possibly play against each other. Um, and Chris came mm -hmm. up with a with a brilliant idea. Uh, maybe there could be teams, as in like Harry Potter houses. And I like that idea. Oh, um, yes. And just as we um, just as we wrap things up. I know we're talking about business at the moment, but just I'd like to pick up on a comment that um, Tesh made um, a little bit earlier. Um, so Tesh says, I'm retired and studying full time. Uh, my object of gaining a law degree, so this is just from slightly earlier, is to assist unfortunate people who cannot afford exorbitant legal fees to defend them and therefore a disadvantage within the legal system. I'll act for people without charging fees. My services will be free of charge. And I just thought that that was a really lovely note to end on oh. when we're talking there around inclusion um, and EDI. And I, yeah, Tesh, Tesh got a lot of love in the chat for that um, and well deserved I think. Uh, absolutely the thing about teams is interesting because again Isadora and I both work on B205 and we do have a bit of a competition where uh, students have to come up with their own product they have to come up with their new innovation that they want to introduce. And we have a dragon's den type approach. We all vote for whether or not we would invest. So we do have that bit of competition going. All in good fun, of course, and it's, it's a great one. So, uh, so thank you, Isadora and Charles. That's been fantastic. And we really appreciate you spending the time with us to uh, just come and talk to us about how modules are created so thank you for that uh, i'd just like to encourage everyone to fill out the feedback forms these are really important um, in all all of the chats we've had today you've heard from my guests about how important it is to hear from students we want to make sure that everything we do is tailored to what suits you best and is going to benefit you and these feedback forms are taken very seriously so after the session please fill it in uh, because that's how we know what you want us to talk about in future and how we justify bringing you more sessions. So I'm going to finish just by a, a bit of an advert. So we've got some more sessions coming up. We've got Studying with Limited Access uh, next week. And that's where we look at modules where students might not have the normal internet access. So how have we adjusted them? And come along and see how these modules have been delivered in prisons, because that's how we're going to explain limited access. 
So I've got three fantastic guests who work with the prison students to, to chat with me. And then we've got some of our workshops looking at using other people's ideas, learning from feedback, taking notes effectively, and how to communicate academically. And then on the 19th of July, we're going to be focusing specifically on those of you who are moving um, into HE study from level one to level two and level two to level three. So we look forward to seeing you at all of those sessions. And I'd just like to say thank you, Heidi. Fantastic as always. Thank you, Charles and Isadora. And thank you, Sarah and Fred from the earlier session. I've had a really great time with you all uh, this morning. So I look forward to seeing you at future sessions. Enjoy yourselves and goodbye.